Welcome, fellow book lovers. I am so happy to be here. I am an author of the forthcoming book, Broadway Butterfly, and the founder and host of Mystery and Thriller Mavens, which is a volunteer authors helping authors initiative that I started during the pandemic. And in the past three years and 450 interviews I've done, this is my favorite book. Y'all are in for a treat. This book is powerful and poignant and beautifully written. And when you get to the final mind-blowing twist, it is a inflection point for a cultural conversation that is needed now more than ever. And I can't say more than that, but it is mind-blowingly good. So be sure to get your signed copy on the way out. Okay, so let's get to our fabulous, fabulous hosts. Um, so Tim Weed, Tim to the stage, please. Tim is the author of two books, a short fiction collection, which is called A Field Guide to Murder and Fly Fishing, which is exactly my kind of fishing. Um, it was named to the Eric Hoffer Book Award Grand Prize shortlist and a novel, which is Will Poole's Island, one of the Bank Street College of Education's best books of the year. He's the winner of a Writer's Digest Popular Fiction Award, and his work has appeared in Literary Hub, The Millions, The Morning News, The Writer's Chronicle, Colorado Review, and elsewhere. His latest novel, not yet published, was a finalist for the 2023 Prism Prize for Climate literature. Danielle Trasoni, to the stage please, is a New York Times and internationally best-selling author of seven books. She has been the chair jurist of the Pulitzer Prize in fiction and a book columnist for the New York Times Book Review. Her novels have been translated into over 30 languages and she has lived in Japan, England, Bulgaria, France, the United States, and Mexico. She currently calls San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, home with her family. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that very warm welcome, Sarah. I'm blushing if you see radiate, me radiating rays of red <laughs> that from that. Um, I also want to thank, before we begin, the, this festival, which is such a special fe festival. I've been to many in my day, and I have rarely had such a warm and wonderful welcome as I've had here. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Kaylee, Hannah, and her team. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Wendy Hansen and the booksellers, and I would like to say a special thank you to Tim Ehrenberg, who has, um, I've, his reputation preceded him, I've been following him on social media and hearing about this festival, and so thank you Tim for having me. And I'd also like to just say thank you to Tim Weed, um, who is a member of my book group, and I've read his new novel and it's so excellent, I can't wait for all of you to read it. Well, thank you. It is such an honor to be here with you, Danielle. Um, I, it was, it's been my great privilege to get to know Danielle over the last several years. Uh, we are both members of uh, the Newport MFA core faculty, and it's a low residency creative writing program. And uh, we most recently spent some time in Cuba together on a writing program and in San Miguel. And I think that um, Danielle and I could probably talk for hours about writing, so 45 minutes is not too long. Um, but I'm also a, a, an avid reader of Danielle's work and everything that Sarah just said about the book is true and more. So you have that to look forward to. It just came out two days ago, so it's, it's definitely something to put on your bookshelf. So um, it is really a special honor to be here today, and I thought that maybe we could start off by, do you want to give us a little flavor of the book? Uh, you know, maybe tell us whatever you want about it and read a couple paragraphs. And... Sure. So first of all, you can all hear me. Yes? That's good? Okay. Um, so my new novel, The Puzzle Master, is about, you guessed it, a puzzle solver. <laughs> and um, his name is Mike Brink. 
He's a special kind of character because he wasn't always an ingenious puzzle solver. He was just a normal person like you and me, and when he was 17, he was playing football and was hit very hard and suffered from a traumatic brain injury that caused a condition that's a real condition, a real medical condition, it's very rare, called savant syndrome. Um, some people who have this syndrome wake up from this injury and they can do things like painting. They've never been able to paint before and suddenly they have a proclivity for art. Um, one person whose memoir I read was struck by lightning and could um, suddenly, a few weeks later, play classical music very well. Um, Mike Brink, in this instance, develops a talent for puzzles, uh, patterns, mathematics, and all sorts of memory games. Um, he can read a book and remember the entire thing, and it's astonishing to him, but also v deeply troubling. <laughs> can you imagine waking up and having a skill that you didn't have? And um, so I'm going to read you just two paragraphs that describe him a little bit. And he's just arrived. This, so I'll just give you a quick elevator pitch of the story. The story is about him, Mike Brink. He's called to an upstate New York women's prison because a woman who has been incarcerated for five years has drawn a strange puzzle. And the psychiatrist of the prison wants him to help her solve it. A woman in a loose navy blue dress stood waiting. She was tall and thin, with dark brown eyes, dark skin, and hair cut in a bob. She introduced herself as Dr. Thessaly Moses, the head psychiatrist. He didn't need to introduce himself. Clearly, she'd Googled him. Still, she stared at him a bit too long, and he knew he, she was surprised by his appearance. He was six foot one and athletic, lean and strong, and as he'd been told, handsome, not at all what people expected of as his mom sometimes joked, a puzzle geek. He wore his favorite red Converse All-Stars black Levi's and a sports jacket over a t-shirt that read, somebody do something. Aside from photos, a Mike Brink Google search would have brought up a video clip of his remote zoom-in appearance on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, recorded during the 2020 pandem pandemic lockdown. He'd taken Colbert on a tour of his puzzle library and opened one of his Japanese puzzle boxes, which inspired a joke about sushi. There would be a Wikipedia page that linked to the New York Times games page, where he was a regular constructor, a list of puzzle competitions he'd won, and another link to a Vanity Fair profile that gave his entire life story, the normal Midwestern childhood, the tragic accident that altered his brain, and the miraculous gift that appeared in its wake. Thank you. So that gives you a little flavor of what you have to look forward to. So um, we, we have a limited time. And so I think what we will do is have a conversation. I want to make sure that we have time at the end to open it up to Q&A from the audience. So we'll get right into the questions. Um, I guess it, maybe like, just quickly, could you talk about you know, your background and what, what led you to want to start writing fiction? Okay, um, well, I feel like that's a very long story. Um, I knew from a pretty young age that I wanted to write fiction because I've always been a big reader. I was that kid that was in the corner of the library when she was seven or eight, whose parents would just drop her off and leave and come back five or six hours later and there would be a stack of books and me exactly where they left me. Um, and when I was in high school, I started writing in journals and knew that I wanted to be a writer. And now I'm, you know, it's, it's been a long journey. My first book was published at 32 after about 10 years of trying to write it. Um, the first book, I think, is always the hardest for people. Uh, and this is my seventh book. So um, I just, it's sort of the only job I've ever had, and if I didn't do this, I might be uh, serving you coffee. <laughs> that, that's probably what I would be doing if I wasn't doing this. Excellent. Um, and how would, you, how would you sort of characterize the, the genre of this book? Would you call it an intellectual thriller, or what would you? What would... Yeah, I like that. I like it. So Tim said intellectual thriller. Um, it's hard because this is, would, I think, would probably be my first thriller. Um, my other books, 
I've written two memoirs that were considered literary memoirs. I've written um, a, no a couple of novels that are considered literary suspense, but this is very fast. Um, you fall into the world of this book and it just sort of compels you to keep reading. And I constructed it that way. I, I wrote the book so that you would open it up and feel like you were in a completely different universe and that you were being pulled through by Mike Brink and his puzzle, puzzle solving. So it's such, a, it's, it's such an original premise for a novel. It really strikes me. Um, I, I remember when I read it a couple of years ago in book group, I was like, well, how would, what, would I, what books would I compare this to? And you know, couldn't think of many, but it's, it's such an original book. We all love puzzles, right? And, um, but to see them so fully integrated into a narrative, it adds a whole new dimension to both the reading and the puzzle solving experience, I think. So what I'm curious about is how did you go about, well, like how did this idea come to you and how did you go about doing your research and is there anything surprising? I mean, that's a lot of questions, but we'll start with that. We'll start with I'll take them one by one. So it's a complicated story about how the idea came to me because it wasn't like I woke up one morning and said, aha, puzzles. You know, that's something that I should write about. Although I was interested, it was during the pandemic, I was playing a lot of Wordle, as all of us were. And um, so maybe that was at the back of my mind. But I really started with a different character in this book, this woman named Jess Price, who is a prisoner in a women's prison upstate New York. Um, she is in prison for murdering her boyfriend. She was a writer um, in, you know, before she was arrested. And uh, a lot happened to her, and she hasn't been able to talk about it. The only thing that she does is she draws this puzzle. That's what brings Mike Brink into the story. But I started with her because the puzzle in the book is extremely important to me, the overarching sort of plot, right? You know, this puzzle that Jess Price presents to Mike Brink in the beginning, and then we move through the book and we solve it at the end. That puzzle itself was really interesting to me. So um, she started first, and the backstory of that puzzle, which takes readers to 19th century Prague, um, is was written first, before I even knew there was a character named Mike Brink, or that this was actually um, only about puzzles, right? That it was a thematic, um, puzzle story. I just knew that I had that one. Um, and then I realized once I had that sort of cluster of stories that I'd written, that it would be, it felt too insular. I wanted someone to move through the book like the reader does and unlock these, um, this mystery. And so um, I started playing with it. I think you read the draft where he was a journalist. Right. Um, so you guys get to see the big messy process of being a writer, right? It goes through many, many drafts and you're playing with different characters. And then that was kind of boring. I thought, journalists, meh, that's kind of boring. What, who would solve a puzzle? And then a puzzle master. And when I got that idea, everything changed. Um, I started, I really, you know, rearranged the book. I essentially rewrote it around the character of Mike Brink, keeping Jess Price, the character I had originally started with in the book, but kind of in the background. She became secondary. Um, her story became very secondary to his. And I went through and added probably 75% of new material around that. So, yeah, that's my big, uh, messy, complicated process of writing. Um, but the research, the research is another story. I had to be pretty orderly about that. I, a mutual friend, a friend of mine knows um, Will Shorts, who is the editor of the New York Times game page and also has a show on NPR. Um, you probably have heard that. It's great. Um, and I reached out to him just sort of hoping that he wouldn't think I was, wasn't, you know, that I wasn't a crazy person and that he would talk to me. And he very graciously invited me to his home where he showed me his amazing, immense, completely disorganized and wonderful puzzle library. He had puzzles from the 19th century. He had a copy of the very first crossword book ever published by Simon & Schuster. He had puzzles I'd never heard of. And so as I was sort of wandering around this, I, it felt like I was seeing the world of my book materialize before my eyes. And it really helped me solidify that character. I knew after I talked to Will Shorts that I could write this character and that there were people like this guy out in the world. Um, there are actually puzzle, some puzzles in the book. 
um, other than the sort of main plot puzzle that I was talking about before. And you know, I'll tell you something, I'm not good at puzzles. <laughs> I'm really bad at puzzles, and I'm pretty bad at math, too. Um, so I needed help, and I asked Will, do you think you could help me make some puzzles? But he was like, oh, no, I'm way too busy, of course. And so he recommended um, two of his puzzle constructors who have worked for him at the New York Times. And I worked with both of them to make these puzzles. So they're really challenging, interesting puzzles. And each of those puzzles correspond with a point in the plot. So if you don't like doing puzzles, you don't have to do it. You can just keep reading. But if you like it, you can pull out your pen <laughs> and you can write in the book and solve the puzzle. Um, so it was a lot of fun to do that part of, of the book. So we, we, Danielle and I had an exchange, actually, I think it was yesterday or earlier today about, um, you know, Robert Gottlieb, the great editor, um, just died. And uh, he had uh, some, he was talking about his experience of working with two different writers. One was John Le Carre and the other was Len, Dy Len Dayton or Dighton, Dighton, Len Dighton. And they both write kind of, you know, thrillers. But he said it was, it was like night and day because if you give a suggestion, if you put a little question mark, uh, you know, to, to John Le Carre, and you say, you know, I don't know, this seems like an inconsistency, then Le Carre will take it and uh, work on it, and then we'll come up with 20 new pages of material that's, you know, really interesting stuff just based on this one question, whereas this other writer would just fix a single line. And um, I think Danielle is definitely in, in the John Le Carré category. I, I mean, it was such an honor to see this book um, take shape. And she's an amazing, probably one of the best revisers that I've ever met. And that's good, because if you're a writer, you know that revising is 99% of writing. So uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to see it take shape. And, and the research was a, a big part of that. So one thing I want to ask you is, um, I think that critics have commented, and, and I've sort of noticed, um, that the, the, one of the things that makes this book unique is the, uh, the mix of this research, this really, really good um, in-depth research and the way it's integrated so um, fully into the story uh, and the kind of very fast thriller pacing um, and, you know, I've, I've even heard Danielle compared favorably to Dan Brown. Um, and so, so maybe Dan Brown, who can write really well, because she, she's a beautiful writer. So um, do these comments, do these kinds of comments reflect your ambitions for the book? To be totally honest, those comments reflect the fact that it was it went through so many different um, manifestations. It started off as one thing and then and transformed into the next. Um, but I'm very pleased that all of the pieces came together. One thing that has been sort of universally said in, in the reviews that I've read is that it's woven together to cr create a story that builds and that makes sense at the end. Um, and the research that you're talking about, um, I am someone who loves to read for pleasure, of course, but I also like to learn something when I'm reading fiction. Um, you know, for me, there, there's, of course, an emotional element between the characters, and those relationships are very important, but I'd like to learn more about, say, 19th century Prague while I'm reading, or I'd like to learn, as in the case of this book, about the history of porcelain making, right? That doesn't seem like something that you would learn in a book called The Puzzle Master, but it's there. Um, and so, throughout the book, there are these sort of moments um, where that research and th that knowledge is, is conveyed either by the characters or by me, the author, in the book. And I like it to feel seamless. So, um, for example, there was one, you remember this, there was a longer section in the book. Um, the 19th century Prague section was maybe twice as long as what it is now. And I cut it in half. Um, did I complain about that to you when I did that? or? Did I, tell I you? remember you talking about it. Yeah, it was very hard. And I remember, very, very I, re I also that. remember 
urging you not to because it was right. so it was you know although the stuff that she cut was so great but it was it was a good decision for the book but it's it is also really all the stuff you cut is also really good so it was really hard it, so the original section i think was 60 pages long and i had a couple of readers early readers say you know that section it's so different than the rest of the book the rest of the book is moving fast and it's moving at this certain pace and then we get here and it just goes really slow and it's kind of dreamy and you know maybe it should be retextured or changed and and so making that decision is one of those moments where you cut something that you love for the um to sort of save the overall book and to make the overall experience of reading feel consistent. And, and dreamy in sort of a dark and, and really fitting way. So I think that the part that remained also is a really great contribution to what makes this such a great book. So good revising. <laughs> um, so, okay, well, this, this actually brings something up because I, I've, I've um, you know, heard people a lot, especially men, talking about how they don't maybe, well, it's, this is a, a tough audience because you're here at a book festival, but uh, uh, they don't read fiction as much. They, they, they want to read nonfiction because they want to read something true. And, um, you know, I wonder about, I, I, I obviously have thoughts about that, but I, I wonder about what your, your thoughts are on that. Like, and, and why people should maybe read more fiction if they you know, what, what do you think about that? This is a hard question, Tim. It's a leading question. <laughs> you didn't tell me you were going to ask me this. Okay, I'm not prepared. Um, well, I also like to read things that are true, right? But I often find that um, I feel that truth more profoundly when it's um, metaphorical or when it's embedded in a fictional world that I can inhabit. And um, the kind of book that this is in particular, where the world, it feels like realism, um, and it, it's written in a very realistic way, but suddenly at certain points in the book, you're launched into a kind of thought experiment about certain characters or times and places um, that allows you to imagine a kind of what if reality. Um, I, I'm gonna leave it at that. You know, it does go into kind of odd places in, in certain ways, but I think that that allows us to explore reality better when we're taken out of our daily life, allowed to reimagine things allowed to wonder what if I were that person or that character experiencing this. And I'll also just say, I, I like, this is why I layer so much research into my books because I do, I think it's great to read novels that teach us something and, and, and have actual information in there that you will be just sort of wandering around in your life and you're like, oh wait, where did I read that? Oh, that was that novel. Yeah, I, I agree. So, and I, th I think that one of the one of the challenges of writing fiction is that because it's not true, because it is sort of by definition a lie, um, it has to be in some way. It has to get at some kind of deeper truth, and it also has to do something that nonfiction doesn't necessarily have to do, which means it has to be alive on the page. It almost has to get up and dance for you. You know, it has to be uh, it, it has to be immersive entertaining, engaging on both the intellectual and the emotional levels, all of which this book does very well. So I think this is, a, this is actually a great example of a book that does what fiction should do or what can do, um, and maybe will have the effect of bringing more people back to fiction. I don't know. Oh, that would be fabulous. I also just would like to say that something that I did set out to do with this book um, and with my other book, the last book in particular, The Ancestor, is I love to take a reader someplace they have no idea that they're going. <laughs> I like them to bring them to start one place and then slowly, slowly over 350 pages bring them someplace that by the end they're like, how in the hell did we get here? But also that it feels organic and it feels like you came along on that journey with these characters. So yeah, I think, I mean, I, I'm obviously all for fiction and I hope that people do come back to fiction. So. You, um, you mentioned uh, something about the elements of the, what, what you, you sort of, you didn't really say the word, but you said that it sort of leads us up to imagining something. Um, so what do you think, I mean, you know, about the idea of the supernatural in fiction? You know, is it, would you say that this book has supernatural elements or, or just suggestive of that? 
So the way that my editor describes this book, um, as I said before, it's written in a very realist way, right? Everything feels very real. There's lots of research. My editor described it once, and I overheard her, and I love this description, so I'm stealing it from her, is that it's um, very real feeling with an, just the slightest effervescence of the supernatural. Right, and I like that because it's not like you're you're opening the page and there's you know strange things flying at you. Um, it feels very real until about the last. I mean, I th I personally think it feels very real the whole way through. I mean, the the supernatural element, that effervescence that here is religious, right? It, it's a. Um, it has to do with the Kabbalah, um, with Jewish mysticism, and with the main puzzle that the book um, explores. And so um, if you are at all religious, um, or if you are interested in the history of religion, that supernatural effervescence doesn't feel so crazy, I don't think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree, and I think that that is just a reflection also of good writing if you can take the reader along with you on that kind of journey, because it is asking for a little bit of extra, you know, belief. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's done well. It's actually an amazing part of the reading experience. But I want to turn to another element, because, it, and, and pretty soon I'm going to open it up to you for your questions. But um, because we're both writers here, I'm really interested in your feelings about suspense um, you know what? What? What are the elements of suspense? Why is important? Why is suspense important? Anything that you can say about suspense? Because this is a book that is suspenseful throughout. So I'm just curious, as as a writer, to your thoughts about this idea of suspense and how it is created. So I think suspense is a false category. I'm just gonna you know say something really controversial here. I mean. Without suspense, there would be no storytelling. Who wants to read a story where nothing happens? Or you don't have to wonder about the ending, or you don't wonder how this character changes, right? The very nature of telling a story, whether it's us at a coffee shop talking to your friend about what happened when it rained last week and the shed, the roof got you know, inundated and everything fell in, and you know, this is, this is the nature of storytelling is to have um, a, a, a compulsion to want to know. Um, and my feeling about storytelling is that it's so innate to human nature that we would need to do it no matter what, whether it's in this form, whether it's recorded, whether it's us sitting around a fire, whether it's us talking to our children about our histories. That storytelling is part of who we are as human beings and is so essential. I also think that we need it because we don't know Right, we have no, we are in constant suspense. We don't know what's go going on here. Like, why are, we, why are we here? Where are we going? It's very suspenseful for us to be alive. So I think that um, writing reflects that. It's, it's a kind of perfect representation of the human condition, which is innately suspenseful. That's a really interesting answer. I like that. <laughs> I have strong feelings about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've also heard that, you know, it said that uh, narrative drive is a function of how uncomfortable you can make your reader in some ways. And so this, this, this idea of wanting to know what happens is a form of discomfort. It's like, I don't know what's going to happen. Or if you're invested in the character, you, you've come to like this character, and you feel, you know, the story has led you to the point where you're actually concerned that something bad might happen to this character, or you're wondering how they're gonna, how, you, how they're gonna solve this puzzle, or how they're gonna get out of this trap. Or maybe it's just a feeling of dread. Maybe you know something more than the character. You're sort of like, okay, you, you know, you wish you could go into the book and shake them by the lapels and say, don't do this because it's going to lead to this. And Run. the reason I mention all this is because all of these elements are very present in this book. It's one of the reasons it's such a, a page turner. So. Well, thank you. I think that's a com I think that's a compliment. Definitely, <laughs> definitely so. a compliment. Okay. So um, I think I think what we have, yeah, we have a little bit more than ten minutes. So I think, um, well, actually, before I throw it out, I, because I I know that in, in at a festival like this. 
uh, there are many readers, but there are also some writers um, and maybe some aspiring writers. So my, my final question to you is, what advice would you have to s someone who wants to write a novel or novels? Write every day. Very simple. That's it. Write every day. Find a time. Um, find a, sp a space that's just yours, you know, where you don't have people calling you, you don't have little notifications dinging on your computer. Um, lock the door, spend two hours writing, and see what you come up with. That's, that's it. Excellent advice. All right, so questions from the crowd. So it is an audiobook, um, and the puzzles are not so complicated that they that they can't be um, narrated, or if they are, they're just left out. Because as I said, you can read this book without doing the puzzles, and you have the same experience. The puzzles are kind of like a visual add-on, I think. Um, and yeah, it could be compared to you know people of the book. I've heard people say that. Um, the biggest comparison I'm getting is Dan Brown, um, and for obvious reasons, I think with you know he has puzzles and, and anagrams and mysteries in in his book, but also I think because it's fast, right? Like the the pace is fast, and there's an ancient mystery, there's a kind of conspiracy in the book, um, there's really colorful characters, um, there's international elements. So I see that you know I see why that comparison is made, but I would like. You know, I also like, for example, Umberto Eco. I love those kinds of books that delve into the history of religion. There's that element here. I mean, what I'm hoping is that in a couple of years, people will just say it's just Danielle Tresoni. <laughs> that's that's what we're, that's the goal. <laughs> yeah, and, and meanwhile, I think that you know you can triangulate between Geraldine Brooks and Dan Brown if you want to say that you know Geraldine Brooks is is also an excellent researcher who can craft a beautiful sentence in English. Dan Brown is a fast-paced thriller writer. Danielle combines all of those aspects. Other questions? ARG, what is ARG? So I have not, but I am definitely going to because <laughs> that sounds amazing. No, that's not, so there's an element, so I, we didn't really get into this because we don't have hours and hours to talk about it, and there's a lot of threads in this book, but one of them is um, there is a kind of, uh, I don't even want, it's like technological element to the book. Um, there's an element of exploring artificial intelligence, excuse me, artificial intelligence, I can't even say it, I'm like artificial intelligence. <laughs> I'm so worried about artificial intelligence um, and uh, other elements that sort of go in that direction of virtual reality and all of this. And I'm writing the follow-up to this book now, and you know there is some elements of that in that book. But now, thank you very much, because now I will start to research more about that. I think it's one of the most pressing questions that we have uh, right now. Um, I mean, we have so many pressing questions, but one of them is how we are going to um, handle AI. You may have had an influence on book three. <laughs> Other, questions? Other questions? Oh, yeah, way in the back there. Well, thank you. That was not a question I was expecting. <laughs> um, so, 
for what you might not know about me, you, nobody, because nobody knows about this about me, is that um, I did feel like I saw a ghost once. I really did. Um, and whether that's, and it's had me thinking. I wrote about it in my one, two, fifth book, I think. I think it was number five, um, or maybe number four, which was a memoir about my time living in France. And I lived in a 12th century Knights Templar commandery in the south of France. And there was a moment where I walked into this, the old part, the oldest part of the house, and I was turning around, I was boiling some tea, I was about to go up and take a bath and making some herbal tea, and I felt something behind me, and I turned and I saw someone standing there. And my heart froze. And I closed my eyes and opened and there was no one there. And so ever since that moment, I've wondered what happened. Was that me, my imagination? Um, I'm a, I have a great imagination. Did I imagine this? Um, it, was this some sort of quantum loop where I'm like seeing through time and I'm seeing someone that was there hundreds of years ago? What was that? So I guess that might be my one experience with a sort of supernatural effervescence, but I'm fascinated by, by the supernatural and by, by religion. Um, I uh, um, was raised in a, a religious family and um, had a lot of experience with the Bible growing up, um, and, and that led to lots of questions about how water is turned into wine and how people rise from the dead and what angels do, and and you know all of those sorts of supernatural questions um, have been in my life, and so clearly I think it in, it creates a um, an element of my work because my you know my first novel was called Angelology, and it was about um, it was a a novel that had another supernatural effervescence where archaeologists find the body of an angel in a cave. And it's sort of the repercussions of what happens when, when they find this physical body. Um, so yes, I, that's a long answer to that question. I'm sure it's incomplete. Um, but now I will be thinking about that in the future. This, this uh, term that your editor came up with, supernatural effervescence, may be one of the things that we all take away from this discussion. <laughs> but if you really want to find out about what a supernatural effervescence is, yet another reason to read the book. And I, fi I actually find it one of, one, of the, one of my favorite aspects of the book. So. Thank you. Other, other questions? So, I think we need to contextualize this. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> let me tell you another secret. No, just kidding. Um, so actually, the, the, the long section that I was talking about earlier, the one that was um, 19, set in 19th century Prague that I described as kind of dreamy, and Tim corrected me and said it's kind of dark and dreamy, um, that, one, that, that was the biggest darling that was killed in this book. Uh, it was heartbreaking for me, and I don't know if you know anything about publishing, but you get to this point in publishing where there's the first pass, right? And basically it's been copy edited and edited, and they set the pages up, and you're looking at it just exactly how it's going to be printed, and they say, okay, take a look, don't make too many changes, right? Because it's a lot of work for everybody. And then I got the second pass, and that section was still there. It was, you know, the 60 pages. and. I said, that's when I decided to cut it. And it, it took me that long. And I still mourn it. And so actually someone suggested when I told this story in a, at a different um, venue that I put that section up on my website. And I think I'm going to do that because that is a way to restore it. And people like, you know, Tim liked that section. A lot of people really like that section. But it's true that we, you know, the, the, the overall book is more important than those pieces. And destroying a book because I'm attached to one section doesn't make, it wouldn't be destroyed, okay, I'm exaggerating, but making something uneven when it could be symmetrical, um, if you cut it, it's worth it. Um, so that was such a great question, but yeah, that was the hardest, the hardest part. I think we have time for two more, few more questions. Um, so I've only been there two years. 
Um, but the influence, and it's wonderful. I do um, programming for their literary festival. And so if anyone loves to attend literary festi festivals, come down to the San Miguel Writers Conference. It's in February. It's very warm and sunny. Um, and I guess, you know, the biggest influence is that it's helped me get distance from the things I'm writing about. And I'm the type, I'm someone who loves to live elsewhere. As Sarah, you heard Sarah say earlier in the introduction, I've lived in many places. I find that I do my best writing when I'm removed from, like for example, this book is largely set in New York, upstate New York, New York City. And I lived in that area and it, I found that descriptions crystallized more clearly, characters became easier to write about when I was far away and I was in the middle of a different culture. And um, so I think that that's probably the, the way that it's influenced me the most. Also, I have to say, good weather does wonders <laughs> for my temperament. <laughs> I'm happy um, to go out of my little dark writing um, office and see, see the sunshine. Maybe one more, yeah. And Tim, in the back. Or is, yeah. So Tim's question, if you didn't hear it up here, was um, how has your relationship, having grown up in a religious family and with religion, how has it changed as an adult? Is that correct? And like, how am I using that now? Um, so I became something of, um, uh, I don't, I, I started studying every kind of religion. As I was growing up, I was raised Roman Catholic, I went to a Catholic school. I went to church every day except Saturday from the time I was in kindergarten until I was in fifth grade. And I'm gonna tell you something that not a lot of people know about me, um, but uh, there was a school shooting in our church um, and in our school when I was in fifth grade. Um, and that just sort of exploded my my life. Um, I stopped going to that school. My parents pulled me out and put me in public school. The priest had been killed. A lay minister had been killed. Um, a janitor had been killed. And it was very traumatic. So I think, you know, I, lately I've been thinking, why do, am I always writing about violence and religion? <laughs> you know, there might be a little bit of a, of a reason there um, in my personal life. Um, but so what it did do is I, it's sort of that tragedy or that trauma cut my relationship with the religion that I had been raised with. And then I was, there was nothing, like there was no more. I went to public school until I was in college, but I started finding myself always drawn to exploring different religions. I moved to Japan when I was in my 20s, and the reason for going was because I wanted to study Zen, and I wanted to meditate and learn about Buddhism. I ended up teaching in a high school and meditating and learning a lot about Buddhism. Um, and I've studied, you know, in this book there's quite a lot about Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah, which I find fascinating. Some part of me needs to go deeper, <laughs> I think, and religion does that for me. And so my relationship to it now is I'm, I'm quite spiritual, um, but I'm not, I'm not um, a practicing uh, Catholic anymore, but I don't think you can remove it from me. Like, I feel like that's part of um, the formation of who I was and who I am, even if I'm not a practicing Catholic. Well, it has been a great honor to be in conversation with you in this beautiful venue. And uh, Danielle is going to be back here signing books. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, <laughs>